Welcome to the Natasha Helfer Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. To watch the video of this podcast, you can subscribe to Natasha's channel on YouTube and follow her professional page at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CST-S. This podcast addresses many topics around mental health and sexuality. It may not be suitable for minors. Some topics may elicit a trigger or emotional response, so please care for yourself accordingly. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by our guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views or feelings of Natasha Helfer or the Natasha Helfer podcast. We provide a platform for open and diverse discussions, and it is important to recognize that different perspectives may be shared. We encourage our listeners to engage in critical thinking and form their own opinions. The intro and outro music for these episodes is by Otter Creek. Thank you for listening. Hello, I am Natasha Helfer. I'm a relational and sex therapist. This is my podcast where we attack shame and get healthier through education, stories, relationships, anything that will help. Today, I am thrilled to be able to interview Dr. Daniel Water. He's a licensed psychologist as well as a marriage and family therapist. He's also an ASEC certified sex therapist and supervisor. So we are cohorts in that department, which I love. And in addition to clinical practice, Dr. Water is also a faculty member at the University of Michigan School of Social Work's uh, sexual certification program, well as he does work at the Modern Sex Therapy Institute as well. He frequently lectures at professional meetings, also has authored more than 30 professional articles and book chapters on topics such as sexual function and dysfunction, as well as ethics and healthcare. And today we are here to talk about his latest book called The Existential Importance of the Penis, like one of my favorite titles ever. (laughs) It definitely grabbed my attention when it came out, A Guide to Understanding Male Sexuality. And I'm really excited to talk to you about kind of your approach and um, you know, your vast experience working with men in particular. And, but before we go into that, anything else you want to share about your personal life or kind of your bio that I missed, like anything about you that is kind of cool? How you, how did you get interested in this topic, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, no, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. I'm very happy to be here and, and have the opportunity to talk about the work that I do. I think the only things that I would add uh, to the introduction that you've already given is that I've been doing this now for about 40 years. Um, I've been practicing sex therapy for a long time. And um, I wrote the book about men because even though I work with, with women, I work with couples, um, men really are the bulk of my uh, therapy practice. And I think that's probably the case because uh, most of my referrals and and, uh, and 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 contacts are through urology and urologists, um, and so usually when men are having sexual difficulties, they consult their urologist first. And uh, and fortunately, I've had a very uh, supportive and um, and uh, and sexually savvy uh, group of urologists in my area, where they recognize when uh, therapy. Uh, would be would be most indicated for their patients. So that's that's sort of how it how it came to be. Okay, that's awesome. Which kind of gets us right into the beginning of what I liked reading in your first chapters was kind of this idea that I think we do tend to minimize male sexuality as simple or simplistic. Um, you even mentioned somewhere along the book, kind of like a graph of like kind of a comic where you know female sexuality is like this panel of buttons, you know, like. 500 different buttons yes and then male yes. sexuality is like this one lover like either on or off you know which of right. course has a lot of implications to erections right they're either on or off <laughs> and, right. and that That's somehow right. male sexuality must be very simple so yeah maybe you could share a little bit of kind of like the myths you're frustrated about in regards to male sexuality why you feel it's much more mm-hmm. complex than that maybe we can start there yeah, yeah, sure. Well, you know, I mean, you've already really sort of highlighted the the myth that I am am, am most interested in breaking down, and that's the idea that uh, sexuality for men is 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 simplistic. It's uh, it's mechanical. It's reductionistic, and and the particular. Um, uh, graph and, and slide that uh, that you were talking about is one that I show a lot when I'm lecturing. I originally saw this many many years ago. Somebody put it up, and it got laughs, you know. But immediately, it sort of suggested to me it's that, yeah, you know, this is really a trivializing of male sexuality. And the men that I work with, and 
anybody who works with men with sexual difficulties can, I think, easily see that this is not something that men take lightly. Um, it's not something that uh, that they are uh, unconcerned about. And it's something that when their penises stop working, they often describe themselves as broken, as weak, as less of a man. So I started to think about, you know, the idea that a functioning penis or not functioning penis meant a lot more to men than just whether or not they had the ability to have sex. There was something much more uh, much deeper, uh, much more significant, uh, much more important uh, going on. And then I started to think about some of the things that the men that I see are willing to go through in order to get their penises to erect, you know, once they're having uh, difficulties. And if you think about it, I mean, while they may be effective in terms of producing erections, they're almost barbaric in, in a sense, you know, putting needles into your penis or using a vacuum pump to suck blood uh, into, into your penis or to go through major surgery for a penile prosthesis. And I, I, I had to wonder, you know, is it really just because men can't have sex or is there something more important? Is there another significance to the penis? Yeah. And oh, yes, yeah. please continue, continue. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, please. Well, I hate to interrupt your train of thought. I thought you were done. <laughs> so, uh, I hate That's to okay. interrupt my clients and to my interviewees. <laughs> so, um, but I would say, I, I think this is one of the limitations or critiques you have of the field in general in sex therapy is that we are very focused on function oftentimes. And you know, if you look at the DSM-5, there's certain dysfunctions that you can qualify for, right? Like erectile dysfunction or delayed ejaculation or premature ejaculation. And, and oftentimes, again, these are looked at through the lens of intercourse sexuality, right? Like, well, if you're having these kinds of issues, you're not going to be able to engage in coitus or intercourse, uh, whether that's vaginal or, or anal or any other thing that you're doing penetratively with your with your penis. Right. And so, and so to your point, it seems like it's very sex centered, very functionality centered versus the more kind of existential, we'll get into this the more existential spaces of what does this mean for yeah. me? What does this mean to have this not working in my body? What, what does it mean as far as yes. my identity? Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 exactly. I think that traditionally sex therapy has looked at function for function's sake as opposed to really trying to understand the meaning of that function or lack thereof. What is it that makes this so, uh, so significant for, for these men? And, and, I, and I'm sure it's the case for women too. Um, I have no doubt about that. But as I said, most of my work has been with men. As a man myself, I felt uh, you know, that I was more qualified to comment on what was going on in terms of men's heads than to... Uh, What's the phrase these days to try and mansplain what's going on in women's heads? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, and the reality is that for, I think, a lot of sad reasons, but also important reasons, we have a lot of information in regards to female sexuality, lots of books written for female mm -hmm. sexuality, lots of female authors addressing this issue. Granted, you know, we're not necessarily caught up medically with all the issues that we need to study for female bodies. At the same time, there's when when men ask me, well, yeah, what is there for me? You know, like, is there a book for male sexuality? My, my list is quite a bit smaller on what I can offer men yes. in regards to kind of sexual help in the self-help arena book area, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I would agree, and I and I think that those few books that are available for men, again, are are more sort of um, uh, function uh, approaches. You know, sort of self help techniques. You know, where this will help you get the erections in order to have sex, which uh, is is important. You know, for sure. You know, I'm not uh, being dismissive of that by any stretch, but. I think that there is a much deeper significance uh, in, in the psychology of men when they're about what their penises do or don't do than sex therapy has, uh, has typically recognized. Register now for Natasha's upcoming Reclaiming Female Sexuality workshop. Use promo code GIRLSDAY to buy three tickets or more for $165 each. Make sure to include the names of the others in your group in the comments at checkout. To register, go to natashahover.com slash retreat. 
Symmetry is now offering ketamine services. To find out more, go to simcounseling.com slash ketamine dash services. You can now register for Unwind Together, an exclusive retreat for couples, October 3rd through 6th, 2024, and use the code UNWIND225 for an early bird discount. To register, go to natashahelfer.com slash retreat. This is not the case, by the way, and and I make this point in the book, uh, in literature, you know, uh, people like uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway and Philip Roth and uh, um, and, uh, and and even you know philosophers Nietzsche Kierkegaard you know they all you know sort of recognize that there is significance and symbolism in what men's bodies are able to do or or not do. But the sex therapy literature has really looked at this only recently, you know, sort of a very surface uh, verse for surface level. I'm hoping that my book it will inspire sort of a deeper. Uh, look um, in the sex therapy community. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I th- it was very enlightening for me to read okay. it, and think through how do I approach these issues and how functional and solution focused am I versus more, you know, like existential and even experiential. And so I, I wonder, one of the things that we typically think of in the sex therapy field when folks are coming in with these types of issues of erectile function and things is, well, there must be some sort of anxiety And in general, we blame it on performance anxiety, right? And this kind of feedback loop that if you uh, are worried that your penis isn't going to perform, that then the next time you are going to have sex, you're even more worried about that because it didn't happen last time. And and off you go into some type of kind of like performance anxiety feedback loop, or you, you know, maybe you're with a new lover, or maybe you're you know, worried about your penis size, or you're worried about your aptitude as a lover. And so a lot of how Mm -hmm. we deal in the field with these issues is through this lens of performance anxiety. And you have a critique about Mm -hmm. that. So can you guess about that for sure? Yeah, sure. You know, I I am uh, very critical of the performance anxiety concept, um, in terms of understanding the etiology of sexual dysfunction. You know, this has been around for as long as sex therapy has been around. Masters and Johnson back in the 60s and the 70s certainly talked a lot about performance anxiety. And that has kind of been universally uh, accepted without question by the sex therapy community. And yet I've been able to find no studies whatsoever that actually looked to test whether or not the etiology for sexual dysfunction really was in performance anxiety. The reason I question it is because so many of the men that I see, they report a long history of successful sexual function, even with the partner that they are now having difficulty with. And so to me, the question always hung out there was, well, why now? You know, if you are, if you have this long history of good function and even, you know, right, because so many people come in and they say, yeah, no, we've been together for a long time and sex was good and now it's not. Why would you become so focused or concerned about performance when you have this positive history behind you, right? It, It just didn't make sense to me. So as I started to look at this more closely, I found that a lot of sexual dysfunction really begins more contextually than, uh, than performance anxiety wise. And what I mean by that is the anxiety that, we're ex- that men are experiencing, and I think women too, for a large part, is what's called an existential anxiety, meaning that uh, what makes something existential is when we see it as a potential threat to our existence or our well-being. And so a lot of sexual dysfunction seemed to occur at what I started to refer to as a relationship deepening event. You know, one of the things I found is that a lot of sex therapists don't spend enough time on sort of the timeline of when the dysfunction occurred. So you will often hear things like, you know, sex was great and then we moved in together and I wasn't able to maintain an erection. Sex was great and then we we got engaged or married or some other, you know, made some other commitment to each other. Sex was great and then we had a, a child. Or whatever it may be, there was some relationship deepening event that I believe triggered an earlier trauma that was suggestive of something that was a threat to my uh, existence or my well-being. So I'll give you an example. 
a lot of times, you know, we would look at trauma in sex therapy from the lens of sexual trauma, you know, and, and obviously sexual trauma can impact the, uh, you know, negatively sexual function. I mean, I, I don't think there's any question about that. But most of the cases that I see are really about the triggering of non-sexual traumas from earlier in life. In other words, people who grew up with a, a history of loss, abandonment, rejection, suffocation, feeling smothered, right? And so as the relationship deepens and my involvement in the relationship deepens, I am now seeing myself on an unconscious level mm -hmm. as being more vulnerable, vulnerable to being hurt, to being abandoned, to being rejected, to being suffocated, to being trapped, whatever, whatever it, it may be. And so what happens is, and I, and I sometimes use the phrase, the penis speaks. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, you know, our, the way I understand the unconscious is the unconscious is a self-protective mechanism. In other words, it tries to protect us against further hurts. So as we get deeper into a relationship, the, the self-protective unconscious kicks in and says, no, no, no. You can't get in that deep. No, no, no. You need to pull back. You need to create a boundary. You need to preserve some space. And in a relational sense, what better way to do that than to disrupt the sexual connection? So you might see it in men. Um, uh, the, the three ways that I most commonly see it in men is erectile difficulty, ejaculatory difficulty, or a loss of, of desire. And what this does is it actually buys them some space. So when the relationship is more casual, it's less committed. My vulnerability is very low. As the relationship deepens, my vulnerability then is, uh, uh, is greater. And my protective unconscious tries to protect me from, uh, from, from getting myself into a situation that feels like there's some threat or some danger there. You know, one of the other things that also makes me think about this uh, that I've noticed, and most sex therapists that I've spoken to have noticed the same thing, is that most times in these cases, men actually don't have difficulty getting erections. And they don't have difficulty maintaining erections for a, a long time. But the erection fades as they approach or just as they begin penetrative sex. Once there is penetration or, or the, the, the anticipation of, of penetration into another body, the sort of fusing of two bodies, that's when the protective unconscious clicks in and the sexual response shuts down and things stop. Most of these men say, I can keep erections for foreplay for as long as we're having it. But as we approach penetrative sex, that's when my erection disappears. So... I see it as not so much an anxiety about performance, but it's an existential anxiety that something in this situation feels threatening to me. Well, and this would be a good point, I think, to start talking about, you know, and just, I know I get frustrated when people ask me to explain something in five minutes or less. It took me, you know, like five years to study, but <laughs> when you think about Ex an, an existential approach to therapy, what would be kind of your best way of kind of hitting the, the main points of what, what that's about, what that approach is about, and in specific kind of these four things that you write about in your book that are existential mm -hmm. kind of meaning making crisis making uh, things mm -hmm. that come us as humans. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I have to say, you know, that uh, existential therapy is such a good fit, you know, for me personally and professionally. So I started out in sex therapy like everybody else usually starts out in sex therapy. You know, I was trained in the, you know, sort of Masters and Johnson's approach and then a modified Masters and Johnson's approach. And, um, and, and you know, it, it evolved ultimately into, uh, you know, a, a CBT, you know, type of, of therapy. And I had trained with Albert Ellis back in the uh, 80s. And, uh, you know, of course, he was you know, people, people recognize him as, a, you know, one of the founders of cognitive behavior therapy and rational emotive or rational emotive 
behavior therapy. But what a lot of people forget is he was also one of the early sex therapy pioneers. He was a founder of ASEC. I think he was the first president of Quad S. I mean, he was very involved in uh, in the sexuality world. Uh, a lot of his writing was about sexuality. And so a lot of the things we learned uh, about um, uh, therapy, uh, rational emotive therapy uh, at the time, um, focused on sexual problems and, the, and helping people resolve sexual problems. And, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot from it. Um, I still use uh, aspects of it. But about 25 years ago or so, uh, maybe maybe even more, I came across a book called Love's Executioner by Irvin Yalom. And uh, Irv Yalom is a psychiatrist. Uh, he spent many, uh, many years on the faculty at Stanford uh, University School of Medicine. And he is really one of the pioneers of what's called existential uh, psychotherapy. And he's written some very influential uh, textbooks. He's written some teaching novels, all focused on existential principles. So I'm reading Love's Executioner, which was, uh, is, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a collection of therapy tales. You know, Yalom has three books, uh, you know, like this, where he, he writes about his work with patients. And they're like case studies, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, the details are disguised, you know, to protect patients, uh, confidentiality and privacy, but he really sort of writes about this process of doing existential therapy. And many of the cases that he would present in, in those books and in other books involved people who came to him with sexual difficulties. So as I'm reading this, you know, I'm thinking, this is just such a, such a perfect fit for the way I think, because you know, one of my concerns about the, the more cognitive behavioral approaches was whether or not there was enough uh, enough depth there and enough, you know, and, and, and was there too much focus on technique um, and, and, and function. Yalom, to my mind, went deep in a way that resonated for me. So I had a chance to work with uh, Herb Yalom. And I learned just a tremendous amount about the existential approaches to treatment and how to apply those to um, uh, to the treatment of sexual problems. And uh, he was very supportive uh, in the work that I was doing. He, uh, you know, I, in the introduction to the book, you know, I indicate, you know, he read every page, you know, and made comments and uh, suggestions and, and was, was, was really, really helpful. And so what I learned from the existential approach was that, uh, again, kind of what we were talking about before, that what makes something existential is when it represents a threat to our existence or our well-being. And the ultimate existential threat, of course, is mortality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that people are, uh, are terrified um, of, of death and dying, especially, and this is a big part of the existential approach, especially if they feel like they have not lived life well. Mm-hmm you know, or they haven't lived enough life yet, which is, you know, a very common concern of those who experience difficulties when they're, when they're young. Mm -hmm. And so the existential approach looks to uh, enhance life. It looks for what is life affirming. It looks to understand, um, you know, happiness, you know, in terms of leading a life that has meaning and purpose. A lot of times when people grow up with trauma, they, um, you know, obviously they fear getting back into a situation that is threatening to them or that is that it would be re-traumatizing. So uh, for men, and I think this is the case for women too, but I think it's more so the case for men, is that men actually communicate their emotions through their penises, through their genitals. You know, everybody, you know, I, I know it's somewhat, well, it's very stereotypic, um, but it, there's also a lot of truth in the fact that, you know, men are not great at articulating how they feel. So what happens is a lot of their emotions get suppressed. They remain unacknowledged, but they're going to come out somewhere. They're going to come out somehow. And so when men's trauma is triggered in a relational sense, when it's a relational trauma, it is going to come out through their penises. So what we're talking about so far this morning is primarily in terms of sexual dysfunction. But uh, I don't know if we're going to have time to get into this or not, but I also have written a lot, and there's a chapter in the book about 
you know, what is sometimes referred to as sexual addiction or sexual compulsion or hypersexuality or, you know, whatever people want to call it. And no one really looks at why does this happen? You know, why, 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 why do men end up in this sort of uncontrolled sexual way? And I've collected, oh gosh, by now almost a hundred cases of men whose sexual behavior started to spiral uncharacteristically out of control following a confrontation with mortality. Mm. Sex is a life force. The penis for men is the, uh, the conduit for that life force. And that's why men, when they are confronted with mortality, their behavior often is expressed through what their penis does or doesn't do, both in terms of a shutdown or in terms of this, you know, sort of spiraling out of control. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered the question about the egg. So, oh, so yes. Yeah, so let me, let me back up just a little bit because there are actually, as you said, four yes. uh, existential dilemmas that uh, Yalom talks about and that I talk about in, in the book. These are things like freedom, meaning, isolation, and mortality. So let me let me try and give an example of, of, of something other than, than mortality, although ultimately they all end in mortality. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know. It's a sad reality. Um, yeah. So, so th this, is, this, is, this is through the mind of an existential sex therapist. So let's take isolation, you know, for example. How does this help us understand sexual difficulties? So when most of us talk about isolation, we talk about it in a pretty traditional way, you know, being isolated from others, being alone, you know, loneliness, etc. And, you know, obviously, you know, that, that, uh, that, that can be difficult for many reasons. But there's a, a sub phenomenon in there that I have that, that I saw in many of the men that I worked with, that I termed isolation from the self. Mm. Isolation from the self refers to um, what we what we used to refer to, and maybe still do in some circles, parentified uh, children, right? Those, when you grow up and you have parents or caretakers that are really not capable of taking care of you or taking care of themselves, and you essentially become their caretaker while you are a child, you know? Uh, these young, young kids who are always, either they have to take care of their younger siblings because their parents are either not there or they are not able these are, are kids who are so tuned in and so worried about their parents or caretakers that they pay attention to every nuance, every move, every mood change, and they adapt their behavior to do whatever they have to do to keep their parent or caretaker from getting upset or from, uh, you know, or, 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 or from sort of, you know, decomposing, you know, in, in, in some way. So what happens is, is that at a time when most children are learning about themselves. These children are learning about the importance of focusing on others. Right. And they don't learn how to focus on themselves. So many times what we see in, 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 in male patients, a very typical presentation in sex therapy, are these what are sometimes referred to as the sexless marriages. You know, why are we not having sex? And very often we're not having sex uh, because... Um, you know, it's certainly in, in a heterosexual relationship, uh, it's it's usually the, the man, you know, who isn't responding, isn't participating, doesn't want to have sex. And what you find when you question a lot of these men is they're actually having lots of sex, but it's solo sex. Mm. They are having robust masturbatory lives, but they don't share their sexuality with their partners. Of course, you know, partners always worry, do you not love me? Am I not attractive enough, et cetera, et cetera. But for these men who suffer from this existential isolation from self, what happens to them is they grow up being so tuned in, so hyper aware, so over focused on how other people are doing that they are so anxious during sex 
about is their partner okay, is their partner enjoying, et cetera, et cetera, that they are completely out of touch with their own arousal, with their own emotion, with their own sensation. And basically they find partnered sex much too anxiety producing. Mm. So the only time they're relaxed enough to really focus on their own uh, sexuality and their own sexual enjoyment, their own sexual pleasure is when they're by themselves because they don't have to pay attention to anybody else. So this is an example of an existential threat. When I am with a partner, I am so worried that if I don't pay close attention to you, you will fall apart and I will suffer like yeah. a child. You know, it goes back to, you know, Alice Miller, you know, in uh, uh, the drama of The Gifted Child, you know, and that, that terrific book. She talks about this, how, you know, a lot of times this kind of childhood trauma, we get stuck back there. You know, even though the circumstances today are so different than they were back then, the trauma, the triggers, the warnings, the fears, the anxieties, they're still the same. They're still the same. So that's an example of, of how... Uh, an existential approach would look at the sexless marriage, you know, for example, you know, especially if the man has a robust uh, masturbatory life, erectile difficulty, kind of what I described to you before, or even uh, delayed ejaculation or inhibited ejaculation. It's there's something that's telling me I need to hold back. I can't go all in. That will be dangerous for me. I will get trapped. I will get suffocated. I will be too vulnerable and get rejected or abandoned. You know, so my life, it, you know, ceases to exist the way I expected. And that's similar with that freedom kind of thought process, right? That something is going to take away my freedom or I'm going to be trapped. Freedom, trapped, yep. Take away my autonomy. So, so basically, in, from the existential approach, we don't really focus so much on the sexual symptom. We focus more on the um, the meaning that drives the symptom. In other words, if you're talking about an existential threat, you know you can recommend exercises, you know, sensate focus, whatever, but they will be resisted. You know, they will. You know, they, and even when they're not resisted. What's interesting is if a man is able through traditional sex therapy to regain his, his sexual ability, let's just say that the therapy is, is, is effective and he's getting erections again, nobody ever asks, so is this enjoyable for you? It's often not. They do express relief. You know, I'm relieved that, the, that I'm able to function successfully, but I'm still so uncomfortable with what I'm doing, that it doesn't result in the kind of enjoyment that we would hope for. So the existential issues, I think, have to be addressed in order for people to really be, you know, to, to be able to enjoy fulfilling sexual lives um, with, uh, with, with others. Yeah, that's really, that's really profound. I think that that's a question that gets missed a lot, you know, regardless of gender or sex is, are you having fun? Is this pleasurable? <laughs> and if, yes. you know, versus just, is it functional? Is it working? Is your partner okay with you or not? Which is a lot of times too, where the distress is coming from. Right. And so one of my listeners, Kenley asks, so how does a partner show up best for someone who's struggling with the existential crisis of some sort? Do you want to, I mean, existential theory is quite relational. We're both systemic mm -hmm. therapists, right? We're both MFTs. And so what, what are your thoughts about kind of bringing in the relationship as part of this exploration? Yeah. So I, I think that I think it's very important for a, a couple of reasons and at certain times, you know, so a lot of times, you know, when there are these existential issues that are resulting in the sexual problem or the sexual shutdown, people will come in as a couple, you know, uh, because they assume that this is a couple's problem or it's a relational problem. It is a relational problem, but it's usually independent of this relationship, you know, like this is a triggering of earlier relationships. So I think it's very important for partners to understand that because, you know, it, it just, you know, it just makes 
so much sense to me that, you know, partners would assume it must be something about me or us. You know, you're unhappy with us. You're unhappy with me. Otherwise, you know, why, why wouldn't you want to have sex with me? Or why wouldn't you be able to have sex with me? So kind of uh, normalizing and, and sort of educating uh, partners about these uh, existential uh, issues, especially if you're able to identify it. In other words, you know, part of the existential approach is creating a narrative that fits, that makes sense, right? So if you're able to say, well, you know, because of these experiences in childhood, that's why this deepening involvement is so, uh, so threatening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what I find is that a lot of times partners will then, um, uh, they'll be very relieved to hear something that makes sense to them, um, especially something that their partner is saying, yes, that, that resonates for me so strongly that they often will then exit the therapy. It becomes more of an individual therapy. And then the partner is brought back in if things have not, you know, resolved successfully, for both of them to deal with any uh, residual relational damage that may have been done to this current relationship. Right. So, you know, it's, it, 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 it is a recognition of the relational uh, piece here and the relational dynamic, but it's also a recognition that it very likely is not about the relationship that the person is currently in. Yeah. Well, which kind of speaks indirectly to this question is, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of anxiety that partners are bringing in as well, you know, and like you said, a lot of anxiety based on... sure. We're going to talk on heterosexual couples again, and you're dealing with erectile dysfunction. It's very common to hear a wife or girlfriend or a partner say, well, you must not find me attractive enough. I'm not hot enough to keep your you know, penis erect. Mm -hmm. and, and now it becomes yeah. a very personal wounded space. And then, which I think does oh, yeah. increase the anxiety for the penis owner, <laughs> right? And, and so then they're oh, off. Yeah. This Meaning, make, they're making meaning about their situation in ways that are not always very helpful, and that contribute right. to the anxiety instead of alleviate the anxiety. Is that? That's fair? right. That's right. And, and it's not limited to heterosexual couples. You know, I mean, the same the same dynamic occurs in the, in, in gay male couples. You know, if you, if my partner is not getting an erection or maintaining an erection, you know, why? You know, what what is it about me or us? You know, it's a very natural question, right? Yeah. So, but then what happens is, you know, traditional sex therapy is, as we said before, focuses so much on the restoration of the erection that it, it, this may be where performance anxiety does creep in is that I do not see performance anxiety as an ideological factor, but I do understand it as a possible maintenance factor. Right. And I think unwittingly uh, in sex therapy, we actually create more performance anxiety than we uh, than we relieve. Um, you know, uh, I, I I don't know if if, if you are how you know how many of your uh, you know listeners um, uh, are 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 familiar with a lot of the existential psychotherapy literature, but Viktor Frankl, you know, from you know the nineteen forties, he was writing about um, uh, the existential approaches to sexual difficulties and. One of the concepts that he puts out there that makes so much sense to me, and we used to talk about this in sex therapy in the early days, not so much anymore, um, but is the concept of de-reflection. So de-reflection basically says that there are some things that if you pursue them directly, the more you pursue them, the more elusive they become. So a good example would be sleep. I, most people have had the, you know, have had the experience of, you know, trying to make themselves go to sleep. You know, oh my gosh, I have to get up at a certain time. It's getting so late. I have to go to sleep. You know, what can I do? Count sheep, you know, whatever. And of course, the more you try to make yourself go to sleep, the more elusive sleep becomes. Um, sex and sexual arousal is another example of that, right? The more you try to get aroused, the less arousing the situation becomes and the more elusive arousal becomes. And so Frankel talks about you have to de-reflect. You can't reflect on it so much. You have to back off of it and not focus so much on how's my penis doing? How's my penis doing? Yet 
in a lot of sex therapy exercises, that's exactly what we are encouraging people to do is to focus on, you know, how's your penis doing? How's it doing? Did you get an erection? What was it like, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think for a lot of people that actually just raises their level of anxiety, which makes it even more difficult to resolve the issue. Right, right. Which is complex because you you kind of talk about this dilemma in the book as well. Like I, I'm, I very much try to take a pleasure centric approach versus a performance centric approach, right? To sexuality, focus on whether or not you're having fun, focus on, you know, the benefits, focus on the pleasure instead of what is my body doing or how is my body looking? And am I acting a particular way, you know, that, that will, I don't know, pass the checklist of being a good lover or whatever that means. Right. At the same time, you're saying that, at the very beginning of the book, you're kind of expressing this as an option to, I think, a group of men that you're talking to that I think deal with these kinds of issues. And, and I think you give the example of like, well, if you can't have a sirloin steak, you know, there's so many of other things. <laughs> What's your second favorite? Meal? Right. So like, you know, you can have chicken Parmesan or you can have pizza exactly. or whatever. And so what's exactly. the big deal if, you know, you can't have, you know, you know, steak this one time and, and that argument didn't go over very well with with the group, right? Or the people you were talking to. So even if, even when we do try to focus on this pleasure and you know pleasure focused sexuality, there's still this kind of existential feeling that but my penis isn't working or my penis isn't that's right you know, the way that's it right. should be. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so the 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 when the penis isn't working at, on an existential level men actually feel much less vital. They feel much less alive. You know, the working penis is not just about having sex. So for a lot of these men, the idea that you can have sex other ways, they know that, they get that, they've experienced that. You know, if you say, well, do you like oral sex? They'll say, well, yeah, I like it. Does not matter if you have an erection? Do you like it even if you don't have it? Yeah, I like it if I you know, don't have an erection. So it's like, well, there's, there you go. You know, like there's some great sex for you. And they say, no, you are missing the point. This is not. And and so from an existential perspective, we're not about pleasurable sex. Um, We don't focus on sex as pleasure. I mean, we have no objection to sex as pleasure, of course. I mean, yeah, great. But the importance of sex for a lot of men from an existential perspective is not about pleasure. It's about feeling alive. Mm. It's about having a, a functioning penis that makes them feel vital. That uh, uh, The existential literature, Yalin talks about this a lot. I talk about this a lot in my book. The existential literature says that, that sex is really a life force. It is the counter, the antidote to the terror of death. Um, I don't know if you recall this from the book or not, but one of the best, most striking examples of that that I can think of was uh, in um, in the book Night. Uh, Elie Wiesel, uh, was a Holocaust survivor, and and spent his his life, you know, educating people about the the Holocaust, uh, you know, so that people would never forget about it and and it would never happen again. He. He talks about in the book Night being on the train to Auschwitz. On that train, everybody knew where they were going. And they knew why they were going. And they knew that what awaited them at the end of that journey was certain death. Yet many people on the train were having sex. They clearly weren't aroused in the traditional way thinking whoa yeah, this is hot you know it was nothing like that this was coming from a very different place this was coming from in the face of death there is nothing more powerful than sex as the life force the the, the procreative life force the gener the generative life force so for a lot of these men and you know they're not really concerned about pleasure so when we try and sell pleasure to them like there are many ways to have pleasure they don't care about that Mm -hmm. they don't care about that they feel like they are weak and i don't mean weak in a sort of you know macho way weak like i am not vital i am dying 
I am not fully alive. That's what the, the penis represents from an existential perspective. And so working with those men about fears of mortality, about fears that they are living a life that is not meaningful, that is not purposeful, deal, helping them deal with the fears that get triggered from their earlier traumas that somehow I'm going to be suffocated. I'm not going to be vital. I'm not going to be able to live a good life. I'm not going to be able to accomplish what I want. That's what makes erections better. That's where it comes from. And the pleasure comes from the feeling of being alive. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's an interesting way, you know, to 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 look at it, you know. But that is the if there is an agenda, that is the agenda of the existential therapist is to help people feel alive, to help them live live lives that matter to them, that are meaningful to them, that make them feel uh, that sort of enthusiasm and and vitality that we hope, you know, we all experience while we're living. And I think what you're saying is, is as people resolve those kinds of existential dilemmas, these symptoms more usually resolve themselves. I mean, I'm guessing there's an, they, they often do. there's an intersection of health, of course, and hormones of course, of course. and all those oh. kinds of things. So there, it's not, I don't think you're saying this is one dimensional, but oftentimes these things can resolve if they're really digging deeper into what, what these traumas are, what these existential crises are, instead of just focusing on the flesh. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. But you bring up a really good point because, you know, this is all sort of assuming that we're talking about people who are healthy. But what about those people who are not, right? So I see many, many men. As a matter of fact, this, is, this has become one of the largest uh, segments uh, in my practice are prostate cancer patients, mm -hmm. men who have had... Uh, 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 surgical interventions, radical prostatectomies uh, because of uh, prostate cancer, and they are not getting erections again. Mm -hmm. They are not going to get erections again on their own. Maybe they will with, uh, you know, Cialis or Viagra sometimes, but usually not. Penile injections maybe, but on their own, unassisted, they are very unlikely to be able to get erections again, and certainly not the kinds of erections they had prior to surgery. So how do you help them come to terms then with the fact that how am I going to be vital when this is never going to be restored? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work I do with prostate cancer patients and other people who have, you know, injuries or illnesses, you know, where that have interfered uh, with their, uh, the sexual functioning that they are accustomed to is they are dealing with what is sometimes referred to as an attack on their assumptive world. In other words, our assumptive world is, is our worldview that's based on our experiences, you know, but we just assume that things are always going to be that way. We make these assumptions that they will always be that way. And then something comes along that puts everything off course. And it's an attack on our assumptive world or other people have referred to this as sort of an attack on our agency. You know, I didn't ask for prostate cancer. I didn't do anything wrong. I, I don't understand why I have this. And so there's a great deal of anger and fear. You know, now I have cancer. Now my vulnerability is really exposed. Now I am concerned about my existence in a very concrete way and these these guys they are not interested in exploring other ways to be sexual until those issues have been adequately dealt with and calmed you know i'm only open to new experiences and new ways of doing things if i'm not terrified yeah yeah no that's that's really Beautifully said. I, I do, before we run out of time, want to pivot back to a, a, something you talked about with more like either hypersexuality or what we might deem out of control sexual behavior, or when people feel like their behavior is out of control, which is typically more the, the population I deal with. So I wanted to just kind of ask you a question as I was reading that chapter in your book, the case studies didn't really correlate with 
many of my case studies, you know, and in your mm -hmm. case studies, it was primarily like people who were going along kind of fine. And then somewhere in their adulthood, um, this peak, you know, happens of sexual activity. And like you're saying, you could kind yes. of trip it back by doing a good timeline and kind of review to some type of either traumatic age correlation. Like my dad died when I was 35 and now I'm 35 or, you know, things like that. Sure. Um, sure. So my presentation is, you know, again, coming from religiously conservative spaces is that usually people are being told that even very simplistic sexual behavior is out of control when it falls <laughs> outside the parameter of like, you know, heterosexual marital sex, right? So if you're masturbating right. the teen or looking at sexually explicit materials as you masturbate, or even if you're having several premarital you know, sexual expl explorations, now you're kind of internalizing this kind of sex addiction or porn mm -hmm. addiction type of identity. And it can lead to quite a bit of secrecy and duplicity and, you know, continual issues. So two things came up as I was thinking, well, how would I conceptualize this if I was an existential therapist? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I came up with two themes and I want to know what you think about it. So one was definitely the freedom one, right? Like absolutely from a absolutely. very early age, these adolescents or young boys, young men growing up in these systems are really growing up in systems of conformity where conformity is valued, where, you know, behavioral standards are valued. And, you know, if you don't conform, then there's big consequences. But then I thought of the consequence and the consequence is not just mortal death, it's eternal death. So I don't start thinking that kind of, I don't know, brought up a light bulb for me that even at very young ages, they are being threatened with things like ideas of damnation, of going to hell and in LDS Mormon land, it's more like this idea that you're not going to get to the celestial kingdom, which is where you can be with your family forever. And so these ideas start having some real effects uh, from a pretty yes. young age when you're already developmentally not, you know, that's a developmentally scary time to be being taught those ideas. So yeah, any thoughts about yeah. how that might impact either people's actual behavior or perceived behavior mm -hmm. being out of control? Yeah, so so I, I think that's a that's a great question, and uh, you're right. In the book, I talk a lot about you know sort of these more obvious triggers, you know, of more you know, my father died when he was 35, and now I'm 35, and you know, or I'm approaching 35, you know, and and my own mortality or fears of mortality are confronting me. But what you're what, what you're describing, even though they're they're different in terms of the the triggering, they all represent threats to one's existence, whether it's eternal damnation or expulsion from my religious community or, you know, whatever it may be, these represent threats to my existence. And a lot of time, and I, and I do have a case or two in the book about this. Uh, the one case I'm thinking of, though, is uh, uh, was from a very uh, religious uh, Orthodox Jewish man who struggled with freedom. Um, uh, be, uh, ultimately, he was having this sort of sexual explosion kind of problem, but uh, it, it started, he, re he sort of remembers his whole life, you know, he always wanted to, you know, taste non-kosher food, and, and he didn't like the fact that there were all these laws and restrictions and, uh, and, and edicts of what you were supposed to do, you know, he, he was more of a free thinker. Um, or he liked to think of himself as more of a free thinker. He had, he had a curiosity about the world that he really wanted to explore. It wasn't enough for him to just know that, well, these things exist, but we have to resist them. He kind of wanted to find out, well, what are they about? And so, uh, you know, there was this sort of sense of being confined, restricted, which translates into suffocated, not really living life, by being shut off from so much of life. And so that's the existential piece there. Some people don't have that curiosity. You know, there are some people who, you know, they, they just sort of take on the religious prohibitions and the restrictions and they, they accept them. Uh, they don't struggle with them. Um, I think, and I, I hope this doesn't come across as, as offensive, 
Um, I don't mean it to be, but my observation is that these are often a lot of people who cannot tolerate uncertainty. You know, they, they sort of need to know that, you know, there's somebody running the show out there and these are the rules and you follow the rules. And, and, and that actually is what preserves your existence, you know, and, and they prefer sort of a very narrow view of that, you know, within these certain laws and, and commandments. So a lot of it kind of is personality related. Some of it depends upon, you know, your worldview, how curious you are about what's out there. You know, I, I, I say in, in, in the book at some point that, you know, existential therapy and existential philosophy is best suited for the curious. Mm-hmm. You know, those who are eager to explore more life than they are allowing themselves to explore from an existential perspective. And, 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 you know, this goes back to, to Nietzsche is, you know, we are authors of our own lives. Mm-hmm. And if we are satisfied with the story we're writing, we're going to be okay. But if we're not, then we're going to want to expand that story. And so I suspect that for some people from very uh, strict religious uh, teachings, if they're satisfied with that story, they're going to be okay. But if they're not, and they want their lives to be something different, then they're going to struggle. And you can only uh, suppress that struggle for so long before it's going to come out in some way. You know, and again, the sexual way is often the way because it represents the vitality, the life force. You know, I mean, people can deal with these frustrations in other ways. They can dampen them, drugs, alcohol, whatever. But none of that is life affirming. Sex feels life affirming, and so even even though the uh, the men that, that you're working with may not have these sort of you know obvious correlations with you know death of a father or something like that, my guess is there's a part of them that feels like they are dying within these restrictions, mm-hmm. suffocating within these restrictions, and mm-hmm. they want they want to author a different kind of life, but are ambivalent about it. Yeah, and well, and it becomes even more complicated when their partners, you know, me included in the past, um, were really taught to be part of that monitoring, um, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, making sure behaviors stay within a, a certain s- threshold. And so I really kind of see this as existential work for, for both people in a partnership, especially a heterosexual couple who is dealing with maybe these religious constraints is, is your ideas about threat, what is threatening, you know, like, if if somebody is like you mentioned masturbating having a solo robust life you know at what point is that normative behavior versus like you're saying maybe avoiding better relational you know yeah. uh, intimacy and and i think that's what a lot of partners come in with that fear like this is Absolutely. sexuality that is solo is a threat to our relationship and so what's the existential fear behind that yeah that's exactly. Um, and, and again, even if it's, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, religious teachings, you know, if, if one partner, you know, sort of longs to break out and the other partner is sort of, no, no, this is, this is our life. This is the way I want to live. It, it creates a threat for both of them, different kind of threat, but it threatens the existence of both of them in terms of how they had assumed their world was going to look, you know, so you know, the, the existential piece, you know, Yalom uh, is, is also pretty clear when he says that he views existential philosophy as a lens that you look through. You know, it's not really a standalone therapy, uh, uh, you know, in and of itself. So whatever type of therapy you practice, whether it's, you know, CBT or IFS or EFT or, or psychodynamic, you can apply these same existential principles to those types of therapy to just give you a better understanding of what the what the what the crisis or what the dilemma is for the the people that you're working with. Yeah, no, that's great. I, there's so many things we could still talk about, but I know our time is up and coming to a close. Sure. I, I I would love to finish kind of with this idea that you finish even with the book. It's like, can we you know befriend the penis by asking it what is it telling me <laughs> what what is what is my penis yes. telling me how is it potentially tied to some of these unconscious subconscious 
thoughts or feelings. You know, I, I work with this with, with women as well. I'm like, let's talk to your vagina. What is your vagina? What is your vulva? What is your clit telling us? Yeah. What does it want to tell us? Right. And so I think for men, yes. I think was, um, sometimes we talk about it colloquially, like fun, like, oh, you only think with, you know, your head, that head, you know, or, and, and I think, again, we minimize a lot of, uh, or make fun of uh, penises in a lot of ways that yes. are not, not great. So if we can really kind of do this more from like a respectful honoring place, like, no, this is a part of me. This is an appendage that means has a lot of meaning, has a lot of meaning around masculinity. Oh, yeah. Like you said, has a lot of meaning around vitality, has a lot of shame that goes along with it. Penis size, all those things that oftentimes are the butt of many jokes. So this is a vital part of yourself. So yeah, maybe if you it, want to close with true. thoughts about talking. It's true. Yeah, well, or not so much talking to your penis, but listening to your listening penis. To you your know, penis. It's <laughs> lis- listening to your penis. What, what, I, what I can say, you know, unequivocally, you know, is that when men are having difficulties with their penises, both in terms of uh, dysfunction, you know, erectile difficulties or ejaculatory difficulties, or when they are behaving in ways that are creating problems for them, you know, this sort of more out of control way, their penis is expressing their distress. These are not happy men. Something is bothering them, something deep, something that they are having trouble acknowledging. Their penis is speaking to them. The task of the sex therapist working with men then, I think, is helping men decipher the message that their penis is sending them so that they can attend to those distresses so that their penises can relax. And relax. Yes. All about that. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Water. I really, really have appreciated this conversation. I really appreciate Thank you. your book. Again, it is you. Fun, everybody, the existential importance of the penis. I highly recommend it. I think it, it was a great read. It really made me think about a lot of things and some ways I kind of incorporate some of these things already, but I'm going to be incorporating a lot more um, given kind of your framework. So thank you so thank much you. for your contribution to our field. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate all the listeners today for, for tuning in. And, uh, and I hope that I was able to make a good contribution to people having better sexual lives and, and doing better sex therapy. I love it. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Natasha Hoffer podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahoffer.com and share this episode. To watch the video of this podcast, you can subscribe to Natasha's channel on YouTube and follow her professional page at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CST-S. You can find all her core resources at natashahoffer.com. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by our guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views or feelings of Natasha Helfer or the Natasha Helfer podcast. We provide a platform for open and diverse discussions, and it is important to recognize that different perspectives may be shared. We encourage our listeners to engage in critical thinking and form their own opinions. The intro and outro music for these episodes are by Otter Creek. Thank you for listening. There is a place where time slows to nature's pace and there is space there to find yourself in her embrace some places should be left alone so we can always go to the homeland of the heart Ten thousand years of our human history etched on her canyon walls alongside her So we can always go to the homeland of the heart, to the homeland of the
without her stars, yet still her presence sustains us from afar. Some places should be left.